Well, hello there. This is a crossover episode between Tales from the Break Room and Unexplained Encounters. Yes, I'm crossing over with myself. That means this episode will appear on both podcasts. And it means if you're following me on one show, but not the other, consider this a call out. Go follow both of my shows, Unexplained Encounters and Tales from the Break Room on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. But if you're listening on YouTube, you're safe for now. Today, I'm delivering a load of new creepy trucker stories to you, from unexplainable things seen on the road to violent attacks on truckers or by truckers. Prepare a big ol' thermos full of hot coffee and buckle your seatbelt and enjoy these terrifying tales. Remember, you can share your stories of the unexplained or scary work stories at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. The Black Dog from The Wolfman I've been sitting on this for a little while. I figure now is as good a time as any to get it in writing. As a warning, this will contain mentions of self-harm. I've only been driving trucks for around two years now, but I grew up around it here and there, and I love talking to the old timers about how the industry was during the golden age of trucking. I got to hear the good, the bad, and as I got into it myself, the superstition. Everyone, no matter who they run for, where they drive, or how long they've been in it, they've seen their fair share of it. I've witnessed pile-ups in the winter, vehicle fires in the summer, and I've beaten the coroner to a wreck once or twice. It's just the nature of the job. The more you're on the road, the more likely you're going to come across some unpleasant things. This incident, or what I believe it to be at least, still gets to me on some of the longer nights. To set up some background, and I apologize if it gets a little long, I'll go into it from the beginning. I started driving trucks at the end of the virus. I'd been laid off after five years at a factory with no telling of when it would reopen. So I looked around and decided that if truckers worked through this, I'd have a job through just about anything. I went to a small school, got my CDL, and got in with the company. After about a year, my buddy expressed interest in driving, so I talked to him and we got him into a company too that would train him and put him on the road. For this story, I'll call him S. S was a few years older than myself. He was in the National Guard Reserve and was looking for some work between deployments. He'd been in for a few years, messed up his knee on a training op, and was now looking to switch his enlisted job. While all the paperwork was in red tape limbo, he wanted to drive. I ran a flatbed through the northeast, and he ran a box for a supercarrier between Pennsylvania and out west. He even sent me pics of the world's largest truck stop off of Route 80 in Iowa. Rarely did we cross paths on the blacktop, but every once in a while, we ended up back in town for some off time. We'd meet up, have a few drinks, and swap stories. Now, we've watched scary movies, and we told folk tales in the past around campfires, but never got too much into it. One night, he sat back in his chair and said to me, Hey, you ever seen the black dog? Now, this made me about choke on my drink. Most of us, we've all heard different things about the black dog. Some say it brings death. Others say it just warns you beforehand. You're always tired, but if you're too tired and starting to ride the rumble strip too much, you may see the black dog. So I sat back and told him my story of it. The way I see it, first time is a warning. You're tired, you get off the road, and you get some sleep. Second time, it'll make you stop. You'll experience something that'll get you to pull over. Animals in the road, mechanical mishaps, random traffic stop by police or DOT. Something that'll get you stopped. If you continue going after that, and you get back between the highway lines, it gets a little foggy from there. No way to know for sure what happens exactly, because from what I've been told, your time is up. Some guys wreck and don't survive. Some are found dead in their rig in the following days heart attack or exhaust leaks, the works. I've personally seen it once. 
It was a foggy night on Route 84 through New York. Happened back in February. I was dead tired. Coffee, energy drinks, Marlboros, nothing was working. I took my eyes off the road for a second to fiddle with the radio, and when I looked up, I saw it. Through the fog, something skittered off the shoulder and into my lane. A shadow in itself. It paused to look directly at me. A black, wispy canine shape with hollow, yellowish eyes. I shot upright in my seat. With a flatbed, you can't slam on the brakes or your load will come up to visit you in the cab. And with trucks in general, you can't swerve much or you'll roll over. So I just gripped the wheel and braced for an impact. But it didn't come. I passed through where the figure was and kept on rolling, pulling off on the shoulder as soon as I could. When I got out, I went around to the front of my truck to look for damage, but there was none. No fur, no blood, nothing. She didn't have a scratch on her. I stood there slack-jawed for a few minutes before remembering the stories I'd heard. And after putting two and two together, I darn well knew what I thought I encountered. So I climbed back in the seat, pulled off at the next off-ramp, and caught some much-needed sleep. I ended up being late to my delivery. But hey, I'm still around. I shifted in my seat and took another drink. He chuckled and replied, Well, I've seen it twice now, I think. I raised an eyebrow as he continued. Yeah, last week. I was headed east towards Ohio, and I saw it once along the side of the road. Now, I was pretty far from my delivery, so I just kept going. About two hours later, I thought I saw it again, but it ended up being a deer that shot into the road as I went to pass it. I ended up hitting the darn thing. I pulled over to check and thankfully it just busted some of the plastics. At this point in his story, I was a bit nervous, but obviously he was sitting across from me in my living room. I asked him, Well, what happened? I finished my run and I ended up delivering. I got some rest and started again. We both kind of laughed it off. Such is the industry. We finished our drinks and chatted into the early morning before hitting the hay. A week or so after that, I got a call from S. He'd gotten into some argument with his dispatch over getting home in time for a wedding, so he ended up quitting the job. He seemed a little angry about it, but nothing serious. Over the next week or so, his luck just kept getting worse. His motor blew in his car, he had even more work problems, money problems, relationship problems, the works. Two days into a vacation, I got another call from a different friend. They gave me the dire news that S had killed himself. He left a note, but none of us got the specifics. And while the army did their own investigation, I never heard from that either. It's been almost a year since, and I'll be the first to admit it may all be a real bad coincidence. But I'm dang scared to see that dog again. To everyone reading or listening, and to my fellow drivers, be safe. S, I miss you, brother. Behind the Mound From Murthra When I was 19, I used to drive a semi with my dad as my team driver. We drove for a small company that often had us in the northeastern United States. My story takes place in a small town in Minnesota. At the time, I was only about 150 pounds and 5 foot 6. Not at all big compared to my fellow truckers. My dad and I had just dropped our trailer off at its destination. We then headed to a local little restaurant that had truck parking while we waited for the phone call with the assignment of our next load. There was enough room for maybe 10 trucks there, so we backed into a spot that was between two other trucks. My dad headed into the restaurant to get us a table, while I let my dog out to use the restroom. My dog was just a small Shih Tzu, so she often rode with us, and she didn't take up much space and always slept on the top bunk with me. I put on my coat, then put her harness and coat on her, and carried her out, 
sitting her down on the ground before closing the door. This place only had one kind of dim street lamp lighting up the whole parking lot, but I didn't mind. We had been to the place numerous times and I was comfortable here. Maybe a little too comfortable. I had a routine I followed at this restaurant. I would walk her around behind the parked trucks, let her do her business, then finish walking around the front of the trucks, back to ours. I would pick her up and carry her back into the truck, take her stuff off, and join my dad inside for some coffee and a hot meal. As I placed her onto the ground, I noticed a dirt mound behind the trucks as a result of the plows clearing snows from the unpaved parking lot. This mound had a gap in it between our rig and the one beside us on the passenger side. I used the gap to walk my dog behind the trucks. She'd only peed here, so I continued to walk her around to the front side of the trucks. As we rounded the front side, she stopped to do her business again, then sniffed around as I used a bag to clean up after her. Once I tied it shut, I started to walk back to our truck. However, my dog stayed where she was. I tried coaxing her to follow me, but she wouldn't budge. I thought maybe her paws just had gotten too cold, so I picked her up and began to carry her. Bitsy, what's gotten into you? I asked, as she squirmed and grumbled in my arms. With her being so small, I was able to keep hold of her, until we turned to go between the trucks. That's when she jumped out of my arms as we reached the door to our semi. Worried the fall might have hurt her, I quickly turned in her direction, only to see her now growling and showing her little teeth. I thought she was mad at me at first. I started to apologize for dropping her when I began to hear a scuffling sound. I spun around to face the noise, which was coming from the dirt mound. As I did, a large man rushed forward with something in his hand. Before I could identify the object, he struck me in the face with it just above my right eye, with so much force I was knocked to the ground. At that point, all I heard was my dog snarling and the man yelling. I tried to move, but the pain in my head caused my vision to go dark. The man had dropped what he was holding then. I later found out that it was a large rock. I then began to hear what must have been his pant leg ripping from my dog's bite. As I heard his footsteps run away, I forced myself to my feet and I grabbed my dog, getting us both into our truck as fast as I could. I looked around then. I didn't know where this man had gone, but I knew I had to tell my dad what happened. I searched for any sign of the man. Upon seeing no signs of him, I ran as fast as I could into the restaurant, found my dad, and immediately broke down crying, telling him what happened. My dad and the owner of the restaurant rushed outside, only to see the taillights of a semi kicking up dirt as he made a fast exit out of the parking lot. When the two of them came back in, the owner was on the phone with the police, and my dad sat beside me, hugging me until the cops showed up. The officers took pictures of my head, where a nice-sized lump had formed, accompanied by a cut. Once they wrote down my statement, they had me go outside and show them where the attack took place. They told me they believed it was another trucker that attacked me, and my dog was probably the only thing that saved me from whatever plans he'd had. Unfortunately, that restaurant didn't have security cameras in place at the time, but they later would install some covering the parking lot. Sadly, they never found my attacker, but my dog ate like a queen that night. It was the least I could do to repay her for saving my life. One rainy night, a lady in white, from the goddess of the void. My second cousin is a trucker that grew up in Grimesland, North Carolina. She and I were more like sisters rather than cousins. We're about the same age. She was a bit of a tomboy and I used to be prissy, but that's changed drastically as I follow the goth aesthetic these days. I was more open to the paranormal than she was, but she didn't seem to completely discredit it. I may have opened a few doors and portals in my lifetime by being reckless. One rainy night while driving through US-70 in Greensboro, North Carolina, her thoughts on the subject would change as drastically as my aesthetic. After this encounter took place, 
because it had shaken her up so badly. My cousin called and shared this story with me. She had been driving down the road with a cup of coffee to keep her company through the long drive. The road seemed empty that time of night. She loved long drives and didn't mind the rain, though at the time the gentle sound was making her tired. But suddenly, she was alert because she saw something. No, it was someone up ahead. It was a young lady in a lovely white evening dress standing on the side of the road. She was desperately trying to flag down her truck. She wondered why on earth a lady dressed like that would be dressed that way, out here, all alone, and in such stormy weather. She didn't have the heart to just keep on driving. Besides, the road was deserted this time of night. Who else would come to help? She pulled over and opened the door, motioning for the young lady to get in. The young woman climbed in and gave her her name. My name's Lydia. I was just at a dance and now I'm just trying to get home. She told my cousin her address. My cousin, looking over the address, punched it into the GPS navigator. Apparently, it wasn't too far away. She tried to ask where the dance had been held and how she ended up stranded alongside the road. But the young woman stayed silent. Thinking her guest was just tired, my cousin offered the young lady her name and let her know she could rest her eyes if she needed to. After all, all that dancing probably wore her out, and it was late. Once again, the young woman did not respond. Soon they reached the destination, and my cousin turned around to grab the young lady a flashlight from the back of her truck. However, just as my cousin was going to turn around to let her out and give her the flashlight, wishing her a nice evening, the young lady was simply gone. She'd vanished. She had only turned her back for five, maybe eight seconds tops, yet the woman was nowhere to be found, and it took her longer than that just to get up into the truck. She felt a chill go down her spine and stayed on the side of the road for a moment to gather herself. She began to Google search the young woman named Lydia, who had apparently just vanished on US-70. The results she received took her beliefs in the paranormal to a new level. Apparently, Lydia is the name of a ghost hitchhiker in Greensboro, North Carolina. She had died in a car crash after a dance and still doesn't know that she's died. She haunts that roadside, forever flagging down drivers passing through, desperately trying to make her way back home through dark and stormy nights. I hid a ghost from Anonymous. A couple of years back, I needed a change, so I decided to be a truck driver until I figured out what else I was going to do. I'd been driving for about six months. One night, I was on my way back home. Everything was going well. I was due to arrive half an hour early to my destination. The clock read 3 a.m. I had just brewed a fresh pot of coffee with my portable coffee maker to keep me awake. That early in the morning, there were no other cars on the road, which is something I enjoyed. Metallica was playing on the radio. I took a sip of the scalding hot coffee when I suddenly saw headlights about 500 yards ahead of me. I didn't really pay much mind to it until it was about two seconds away from passing me, because that's when the passing car suddenly shifted over into my lane, full speed. I hit the brakes as hard as I could. The second the car hit me, or should have hit me, everything went dark. My headlights, the lights on the dashboard, everything, even the engine stalled. The semi came to a long, grinding halt. I was surprised it didn't roll over. What was weird was that there was no sound when it happened. No loud bang, no sound of metal bending, just the screech of tires specifically just my tires. When I came to a standstill, I jumped out of my truck, confused. Did I hit anything? I was sure that I hit something. The car was in my lane when everything went black. I looked around in the dark, but I didn't see anything out of place. No damage to my truck, nothing of the sort. I was really confused and worried. I walked around a bit, 
I told myself that the car must have missed me just barely somehow. So I got back in the truck. I tried to start it, but nothing happened. It was like the battery was completely shot. I took out my phone to call for a roadside assistance, but even my phone was completely dead. I swear that battery was full. I had just checked my schedule not 15 minutes ago on it. I had no idea what was going on, so I thought I'd take a sip of coffee and wait for another car to drive by. I would try to get them to stop and ask for help. When I brought my coffee back up to my lips for another sip, expecting a scalding mouthful of freshly brewed coffee, it was ice cold. Like if you had taken it from the fridge after hours of it being in there. What in the world was going on? I sat there a minute, wondering what was happening. That's when I saw light in my mirror. I jumped up out of the truck, waving my hands at the car. The vehicle slowed down. An elderly man rolled down his window and asked if I was okay. I said yeah, but my truck stalled and I couldn't get it to start. A woman sitting next to the man lended me her phone and I called for roadside assistance. I thanked the elderly couple for the help and I got back in my truck, forcing down the now cold coffee. Half an hour later, a small truck stopped in front of me. A young guy in his early 20s got out, greeting me and hooking my truck up with power cables. I started the semi and I drove to my location. The next couple of days, I couldn't get what had happened out of my head. I didn't really believe in ghosts or the occult, but something weird absolutely happened that night. Over time, I would occasionally research that road, looking to see if it had any weird history. An article I found was about a 19-year-old girl that had been driving and was hit by a truck and killed. What really freaked me out, though, was that the accident that killed her happened around 3 a.m., exactly five years ago from the day my incident occurred. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I felt sick. Had I run into a ghost? I've never told anyone about this, fearing that they wouldn't believe me, but I know what I saw was real. Scariest Trucker Encounter From Ashu a couple of days ago, my uncle, who works as a trucker in the mountainous region of the Himalayas, told me about his recent experience that he couldn't make sense of. This is his story and his perspective. It was a long day. Work was over. I was making my way to the parking lot to park the semi. The place was barely a parking lot, really. It lacked lights in many parts of it. At night, it was very difficult to navigate that parking lot. At midnight, I parked my truck and called my mate to know if there was any space left to sleep in the building. He said, Yeah, but it's the room you hate. You know, the one with the small bed. But it's the only one left. You coming? I replied, No thanks. Guess I'm sleeping in the truck tonight. I went back to my truck in the parking lot and settled in the driver's seat. I decided to sleep. Even though I was tired, for some reason I was unable to fall asleep. I'd never felt that kind of urge to stay awake at night before. It was odd, but I went with it. So I got out my phone, scrolling through some Instagram reels and watching some videos on YouTube. I did this for what must have been three hours. By then I checked my phone for the time, 2.48 a.m., my eyes were all watery and heavy from looking at my phone's screen in the dark too long. By then, I was definitely beyond tired. I decided to just close my eyes, let sleep drift me away. After only a few minutes, I was startled by the heaviest thump I've ever heard in my life. It was powerful enough. I felt it deep inside my body like a bass drop in a song. It was so loud, yet somehow very silent, as if it was coming from very far away, still carrying that same thumping power. I tried to make sense of it. I came to the conclusion that maybe someone's stuff fell down while putting it in their truck. I know it sounds weird, 
but it was the only thing that made sense to me at the moment. The idea made me feel better so I could go to sleep again. Not even after like 30 seconds though, I was again startled by the same kind of thump. I shot straight up in my seat. It came again after that. Another, then another. It didn't take me more than a second to realize these thumps were actually footsteps from something huge, something bigger than I could imagine. It almost felt like I was hearing some dinosaur walk in front of me. Soon, the footsteps sounded like they belonged to something that was with me in the parking lot. Not long after that, I heard a truck's security alarm go off due to these footsteps. Then there was another alarm and another perfectly synced with the steps. They drew closer and closer every second. I was looking out the windshield with my eyes peeled, but I still could not see anything. I dared to turn on my truck's headlights, and as soon as they came on, whatever was standing in front of my truck flew straight up. I swear I saw something enormous go straight up with lightning speed. All the dry leaves on the ground began to fly in every direction from an enormous gust of wind that this otherworldly creature created with its humongous wings. I could hear the gusty sound of the wings flapping even inside my truck. After like 10 seconds, it landed to the left of my truck. By that time, I was sure I was going to die. I grabbed my flashlight from the tiny locker I had in the dashboard of my truck. I shone it in the direction where I thought the creature was. By extreme luck, or unluck, the light from my flashlight happened to land on the face of it. Chills went down my spine as I looked at this demonic creature. Its eyes reflected bright red, its face was human-like, its fur was white as snow. Then it screeched and growled at the same time, creating the most god-awful sound I'd ever heard. It looked as if it was grinning at me. It showed extremely sharp and small teeth. It didn't have a nose. I felt it was taunting me. I shifted the flashlight to its wings. What I saw was sheer nightmare fuel. Its wings didn't have fur. They were bright red with every little vein visible. You could literally see every vein distinctively. Then I watched it walk away, again creating those heavy footsteps, causing every truck's security alarm to go off around it. Soon the footsteps became almost inaudible. As soon as they did, I started my truck and noped the heck out of there, driving over 50 miles per hour on those hilly roads. I tried to call my friend back, but my phone died, thanks to my super long Instagram binge. To this day, I feel that thing did not belong in this world. The aura that came from it was so dark, so negative. Perhaps God was by my side that day, so I'm here, telling you my experience. Room 1209 From J.R. I've been a truck driver since I was 21. I was planning on going to college, but my family had money issues, so I decided to find a job instead. My uncle was a truck driver, and he referred me to the job. To be honest, it was pretty hard at first. I had to take a test and take classes, and took at least four months for me to become a truck driver. As I became an official truck driver, I was working like crazy going to small towns, cities, and small companies, dropping off partial pallets. As I became a semi-senior driver, I was offered a drive to Seattle. It was a pretty long drive because I lived in Minnesota, but I took the offer. The arriving schedule was one week. I had to be there with the products by then, so I had to make haste. I prepared everything and my employees helped me with the products. When everything was ready, I headed out to Seattle. It took me about five days to reach Seattle, but I was able to deliver the goods. As I was about to head back home, I was feeling pretty tired, so some of the employees recommended a small motel. When I reached the motel, most of the rooms were occupied, except for room 1201. I didn't care. I was just tired of driving for the day. 
The manager of the place told me about the rules and all that. All I remember was that every room that had a 9 on it was a maintenance room. I took my room key, went to my room, and knocked out. I woke up later around 1am because my AC was broken. I tried to fix it myself, but I couldn't. So I called up the main desk, but no one answered. I remembered what the manager told me, that every room with a 9 was a maintenance room. So I went outside of my room and looked down the hallway towards room 1209. The light was on in that room, so I thought the maintenance guy must be working. I called out, Hello? Is there anybody in maintenance who can help me with the AC in my room? I think it's broken. No one replied. So I waited a little bit. Then a woman replied back to me. She walked halfway out of the room and said, Hello, this is room 1209. I'm sorry, but I'm a little busy at the moment. I'll be there in a bit. Thanks. Then she walked back in. I replied, telling her, Okay, thank you. I went back to my room but forgot to tell her my room number. So I went back outside and called out. Oh yeah, it's room 1201. Once again, she went halfway out of the room and replied. Hello, this is room 1209. I'm sorry, but I'm a little busy at the moment. I'll be there in a bit. Thanks. I was confused. She said the exact same thing. When I was about to call out to her again, she came back the same way and said, Hello, this is room 1209. I'm sorry, but I'm a little busy at the moment. I'll be there in a bit. Thanks. I just stood there, wondering why she kept saying the same thing over and over again. So I waited for a couple more seconds. And it happened again. I was beginning to feel creeped out. I remember thinking, screw this. I grabbed all my things and got out of my room. I walked into the hallway and she replied the same thing again. I ran out of that motel as fast as I could. I got in my truck and drove away. Two strange occurrences while trucking. From Lost They Are. I'm not a trucker, but my dad is. These are two of his experiences while at work, and I'll tell them from his point of view. One night, I was fetching my truck from the yard I used to keep it in. It was around midnight. I stepped out to open the gate, and I noticed two things. A strange, strong smell around me like rotting flesh, but way worse. And all the dogs within the neighborhood going absolutely bonkers. I don't scare easily, but just experiencing that rose the hairs on the back of my neck. The worst feeling of dread washed over me then. I threw the gate open, drove through, parked my car next to the truck, and quickly grabbed all my things. That feeling of pure terror got worse by the second. I locked up my car and climbed into the safety of my truck, and I hauled tail out of there, not caring to close the gate again. Later in the day, I called the lady who owned the yard. She lived on the property as well, and apologized for not locking her gate. She told me she had woke up when I pulled in and had also noticed the weird smell and all the barking. She said she totally understood. She also felt that same weird dread. To this day, I believe the devil himself had been out there that night. Quick note, for the next story, my dad didn't specify which direction he had been driving. So I'm sorry if there's any confusion. This took place in California. On another occasion, after I'd been driving all day, I decided to pull into a rest stop to get some much-needed sleep. The closest place to stop was the Wesley rest stop on the I-5. I pulled in, found a place to park, and started to get ready for bed. I always made sure to turn off my radio completely before bed. It's one of those older dial radios, which has to click in order to be completely off. Once I made sure everything was ready, I headed to the back and lay down. Just as I'm drifting off to sleep, I began to hear these voices coming through the radio. It sounded like two truckers talking about their day. That's strange, I thought. I just turned it off. 
I always made sure it was off, like I said. So I got up and went to double check. I made sure I heard the click, signaling that it was off again. I headed back to bed and I lay down. Once more, I was awakened by voices from the radio. Annoyed, I got up, thinking I might have left the window open. Maybe that's what I was hearing. I peeked out. No one there. Once again, it was my radio. I made it click again, and I shuffled off to bed. Before long, I heard it click on again. But this time, I didn't hear any voices. Just static. Fed up, I just yelled out, Are you gonna let me sleep? At this, I kid you not, the radio just shut off, and it didn't come back on for the rest of the night. The next morning, I asked the other truckers around there if they'd ever experienced anything similar, and it seems like they did. According to some, a while back, a woman died in the rest area. No one really specified how she died. They say she still roams there, playing innocent pranks on truckers, usually turning on their radio or moving things around, but nothing harmful. If anyone wants to try to experience that, it's one of the Wesley rest stops in California on the I-5. The Open Road and the Wendigo From the Goddess of the Void The first time I went with my cousin on her big rig for a trip, it was to visit my boyfriend at the time. I don't exactly remember what area of the road it was on, but I know it was evening on a road surrounded by woods on the way to Greensboro. That night, I swear we encountered something straight out of the scary stories I listened to so often, and I can't help but feel it was my fault. I'll refer to my cousin as L for privacy reasons, and the story is from my perspective. It was autumn of 2015, if I recall correctly. This was some years ago, back when I was taking a break from college due to anxiety. Something bad that happened that I wish not to repeat here. My boyfriend, Chris, lived in Greensboro at the time. It was nearly fall break for him, but he had a job and he had little gas, so he couldn't pick me up. However, he said that if I could make it there, he could bring me back by the next weekend, so we would have a whole week together. My mom's vehicle wouldn't make the trip, and my dad had worked all week and needed some rest. My brother was in graduate school at the time, and he was all the way in G. Vegas or Greenville, North Carolina, so all seemed hopeless. I was just about to call Chris to let him know I couldn't make it, when I heard a knock at the door. It was my second cousin, L, the sister I wished I had. She came in to visit the folks and myself, and we talked for a bit. When my parents asked her where she was headed, she answered with, Greensboro, and after I deliver, I get to drop off my rig, get my car, and go back home for a week of vacation time. This was my chance. I asked, L, would you mind taking me with you so I can see Chris? My boyfriend? I looked at her with pleading eyes. My parents gave me a look and I pointed the same puppy dog eyes at them. They sighed. L agreed. Dad stood up then and he warned me. Keep your seatbelt on. Keep it on at all times. Don't distract your cousin from driving. You could cause a massive wreck. I don't want to lose either of you. If L gets tired, tell her to pull over and rest. And also... I was used to my dad worrying. I had a chronic illness and I was his youngest. But Elle stopped him in his lecture. Don't worry, she'll be well taken care of. I got plenty of coffee to keep me up. And some conversation will help me stay awake. Definitely not a distraction. My dad thought for a minute and nodded. He gave in, telling Elle to drive safe. She said she would. Alright, get your things. We're heading out, Elle told me. I nodded, and around 6 p.m., we were on the road. My cousin and I had been talking about our different scary or paranormal experiences. She reminded me about the ghost hitchhiker story, and admitted when she vanished, she could have fainted right then and there if it wasn't for the adrenaline rush. Before long, we started to talk about other things. I ended up bringing up cryptids. 
wendigos, skinwalkers, and the like. She laughed it off, saying that's a bit of a stretch to believe in. The day I see a wendigo or skin thing is the day I give you a hundred bucks. Elle continued to laugh. I huffed, a bit annoyed, but I couldn't blame her. She'd been a skeptic prior to the Lady in White incident. About an hour and a half into the drive, maybe a little less, we arrived in an area of the road that was surrounded by thick woods on all sides. A fog rolled in. I got lost in the intricate swirls of fog that almost seemed to come from the woods itself. Elle had gone completely silent then, before gripping the steering wheel tight and saying, All right, Mel, I need to focus now. The fog's really thick. I told her I understood. I began to just to listen to stories about Native American folklore creatures. Just as I was getting comfortable, my cousin screamed and cursed at the top of her lungs. I suddenly felt a jolt, and the cab shook violently as did the back. My cousin didn't want to scare me, so when I unplugged my headphones to ask what happened, she said we had hit a pothole. Elle told me not to worry. Still, I couldn't help but feel unsettled for some reason. I rolled down the window, listening to the nightlife outside. It was a cool night and the breeze felt nice. I enjoyed hearing the owls and night creatures singing their songs. I only wish I could see them through the fog. A mile or two up the road, one of Elle's tires began losing air pressure. She cursed under her breath and pulled to the side of the road. Mel, I gotta tell you, that wasn't a pothole a couple miles back. I think I ran over a buck. I mean, I think it was a buck. If it was, it was in terrible shape. That's why I didn't want to tell you. Elle admitted with a guilty look. I understood where she was coming from. She knew I loved animals, but the way she said the condition of the creature was the reason she said nothing. That statement had some weight to it. She told me she was going to walk back, move the buck off the road so no one else had to hit it. She would then take pictures and file a report with her company. She'd be back as soon as possible. I took note of her taking a pistol from her luggage in the back seat, a magnum. She left the keys so I could stay warm, but I loved the cool night air and the sound of the night creature's music. Elle had been gone for 40 minutes and I was getting worried, so I got out of the truck, taking the keys with me after shutting it off. I began to walk in the direction she'd gone. As soon as I got a good distance from the truck, nature's night sonata went quiet, making the night suddenly feel as cold and bitter as winter. Then, I heard movement ahead of me. L, is that you? I called, thinking maybe she was dragging the deer into the woods. But I was only half a mile, maybe three-fourths of a mile away from the truck, and the accident had happened two miles back. But then I heard her. Mel, is that you? Mel is a nickname L calls me. I felt relieved briefly as I cried out. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, it's me. Are, you okay? Are you okay? I asked, starting to run close to the trees where I thought my cousin may have gone, to the side of the road, trying to avoid cars on the road or something like that on the walk back. But as I drew closer, a scent like rotten meat, sulfur, and iron assaulted my olfactory senses and made my stomach go into a cosmic meltdown. The voice came again. Mel, Mel is that, that you? Is that my heart dropped right into my stomach when I heard the voice a bit closer to me. It didn't sound quite like Elle anymore. It sounded more like a recording of Elle's voice repeating what I had just said. I felt chills go down my spine. What had been relief turned into primal fear in an instant, especially when it used Elle's voice angrily towards me. But it was more guttural, malevolent, Mel, get over here, right now, I know it's you. The thing pretending to be my cousin spoke again. That awful smell I smelled before was much closer, much more potent. Then, something moved in the woods right in front of me. I could make out pale skin, 
a deer skull, antlers, huge antlers, and that creature had to be standing nine feet tall or more. I saw two glowing red eyes approaching me from the woods. I tried to backpedal even more, but I ended up tripping and falling on my backside. As it came into view, I saw sharp teeth, sickening skin, a malnourished body, long arms, and dagger-like claws. The smell was unbearable now. I gagged. The shape towered before me, and it began to make a sound like a laugh in a deep and throaty voice. It was like it was taking pleasure in seasoning its prey with fear and hopelessness. At that moment, I did the only thing I could think to do. Scream. I screamed so loud it echoed through the night. I then heard something else echo. A gunshot. It was L. The creature flinched and screeched. At the same time, L ran to me. The thing's cries echoed into the night instead of my own. Then it growled before limping back into the woods. L picked me up and we both ran to the truck. However, the tire had to be changed. While I held the gun and guarded her back, she changed it. Once she was done, Elle and I ran into the rig without a second thought, speeding the rest of the way towards Chris's place. When my boyfriend Chris asked why I was so late, well, sugar, honey, iced tea, this man wasn't religious, nor did he believe in the paranormal or the supernatural much less cryptids, so I decided to lie. My cousin L caught on and went along with the story. I told him we'd hit a deer on the way up, and also took a few wrong turns, but luckily I got us on the right track with my GPS, and thus we arrived safely. I don't think Chris really bought it, but he looked at my disheveled appearance and my cousin's similar look and decided not to pry further. He was just happy to hear that we both made it safe and sound. I gave Elle a hug before she went off to deliver her load and afterwards headed home for her vacation. I told her to be safe and she gave me a pat on the back. Don't worry, I'm the scariest thing out there, Elle joked. She slipped a $100 bill into my hand and winked, then turned away, shouting a warning to Chris. You break her heart, I'll break your bones. I giggled and Chris actually laughed. She waved goodbye from the truck and wished us goodnight. If only it could have been a good night, I was so exhausted. I had nightmares about that creature, and I just knew it was me talking about stories of Wendigos non-stop in the truck that caused it to appear. Legends do say that when you speak of such things, it draws them to you. Maybe I've opened a few too many doors and portals by being reckless. Had my cousin L not been there, I probably would have died, eaten by something that looked an awful lot like a wendigo. Death Day on the Highway From Anonymous I've been a trucker for a long time. It's not exactly a glamorous job, but it keeps the lights on and puts food on the table. Now, I've seen some pretty messed up things in my years of long-haul trucking. Everything from the cops taking down prostitution rings to drug-addicted amputees trying to claw their way into the back of my trailer. But nothing was more disturbing than the warm summer night in 2006 when I was hauling medical supplies across the I-40. I had just crossed the border from Oklahoma to Arkansas. It was around 2 a.m., I was coming up on a truck stop in about 20 miles. It wasn't the first time I'd spent the night at this truck stop, and it wouldn't be the last, as this was a route I would use often. I was on the road going maybe 60 on an empty freeway. I was cutting it pretty close on time, but I was confident that I'd be able to reach my destination as scheduled. I was tired, really tired, the result of meeting up with a trucker buddy of mine at a diner. He and I had one too many, and the result was sleeping through my alarm. I'd glanced in my mirror as I did periodically. I had to do a double take. For a split second, I could have swore I saw a deer burst through the tree line. While this isn't exactly an abnormal occurrence, what made it odd 
was that the deer had quite the impressive rack from the glimpse I saw. But it was June. Any bucks should have shed their antlers for the time being. I was about to brush it off as a late bloomer, or even just my eyes playing tricks on me. But I was jarred from my thoughts when I heard a loud metallic thunk from my trailer. My initial thought was that something came loose, so I'd have to check that at the truck stop. I took another glance at the mirror just in case I'd hit a branch or something along those lines when the most disturbing sight I'd ever seen stared back at me through the mirror. It's going to sound bizarre, but hanging on the side of my trailer was this hideous deer man thing. Its arms were unnaturally long and ended in fingers that dug straight through the steel trailer. Its head resembled a deer skull, but with massive canine-like teeth. The creature let out a bone-chilling scream that resonated in my skull. I couldn't see below the creature's waist, as the rest of it was obscured by the massive antlers adorned on the thing's skull. You always hear about fight or flight, but when something like this is staring you down, and it's the physical embodiment of dread, you tend to just freeze up as your mind attempts to comprehend what you're looking at. I was torn from my frozen state as I almost ran my truck right off the road from staring in the mirror too long. I didn't know what to do. What do you do when a monster is climbing on the side of your truck? I didn't have any weapons. I couldn't just scrape it off. The guardrail prevented me from it. My thoughts were interrupted by another clang. I glanced in my mirror again to see the thing climbing my trailer like it was a ladder, aluminum steel breaking beneath its fingers like molten plastic. As it approached, I could make out more and more off-putting details. Clawed fingers, matted, decaying fur, glowing yellow eyes floating inside dark sockets. I suddenly had an idea. You see, truckers are trained to never slam the brakes in case there's someone behind you you can't see. But this nightmarish thing was ten feet from pulling me right out my window, so I was kind of out of options. I sped up, pedal to the metal, and watched as the speedometer hit seventy. I heard it screech outside, just before I slammed the emergency brakes. I watched the creature fly about fifty feet out in front as the truck began to skid along, but I quickly released the brake and floored it again, this time aiming for the creature. Somehow, the thing was not killed by the impact. It didn't even seem scathed, as it shambled onto what appeared to be cloven hooves and stared at me. That impact was loud enough to let me know I was going to need some serious repairs. Its arms reached over the hood, mangled fingers reaching for me. Seconds before it cracked my windshield, I saw its body get sucked beneath the truck, where it cried, pained cries. There was a series of sickening crackling sounds as it was crushed. I didn't stop to see if it was dead. I hightailed it out of there instead, before it could have the chance to get up. I can't say that I saw the creature again. I never saw it as I passed back through that area of highway. Of course, I never went on that section of road again during the night. Heck, I went out of my way to avoid doing so, pulling all-nighters just so I could drive by that section in the day. To me, it was worth it. I never told anyone about the incident. I just told the company it was a bear. They didn't seem to question my explanation beyond that. If I'd said what actually happened, I'd be tossed in the loony bin for sure. For the longest time, I didn't tell that story to a single soul. Not until my grandniece asked me about the scariest thing I ever saw on the road. Heck, she's the reason I'm posting this now. I hope my story can help others. Normally, there's some kind of message or moral at the end, but if I had to give some advice, I'd just say to be careful. This world wasn't always ours, and whatever's out there won't give it up without a fight. The Shadow of Vidalia From Blitzed Moogle I'm currently doing solo over-the-road trucking. I've been doing this for three years now, but this happened a month after I got my CDL, while paying it off working for CRST. And yes, I know, 
CRST is not the best company, but they helped me get my foot in the door. I was doing team expedited driving with my mentor, Finisher, at the time. As a night driver, it's a lot easier for me, as there's obviously less traffic on the interstates. But this night in particular, I was heading off the back roads in Georgia, going to Vidalia to the shipper to pick up some suitcases to take to Los Angeles, California. If you know anything about the back roads of Georgia, it's definitely eerie. Every two or so hours, you reach a small town with only one stoplight, and then there's another two hours of deserted tight roads with forest all around. I was only three hours into my drive. Funny enough, I was listening to scary podcasts. Beyond that, it was just the droning of the wheels as I sipped my full throttle energy drink. My headlights were the only source of light, which working for a company and the fact my truck was a beat up 2016 Freightliner with half a million miles on it, these lights sucked. I might as well have had a candle lighting the way. As the drive went on, all of a sudden, a light fog began to come in. I mean like a cartoony fog that you see in graveyards like the old Scooby-Doo shows. Like someone turned on a fog machine and kept it low to the ground and it stayed there. I was expecting something terrifying to suddenly dart across the road. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Not even a few minutes after the fog rolled in, I came across an open field on my right side. During that brief opening was definitely one of the weirdest moments I've experienced. In that field, there were three small dilapidated looking houses, each one story, all log cabin-like houses, which you would expect to see in the Old West. Two of the houses were pitch black and completely empty looking, but the farthest one on the right, as if someone was literally expecting to see me, like clockwork, it had a dim orange light source coming from the open door. In the doorway, I could make out a huge, obese human figure standing there, and I mean they weren't moving even a bit, but I could still sense that the figure was watching every bit of movement as my truck passed by. The best way I could describe the shape is for those who might have played Red Dead Redemption 2. If you did that mission with the pig farmer couple, you'll know this figure was as huge as the brother from that game. Luckily, it only happened for a moment, and just as fast as it came, the fog and everything else went away. Nothing else happened, thankfully. No spike strips, nothing running my rig off the road, no cliche like my truck stalling and me having to turn the ignition a few times to get it started. I came out just fine and made my delivery on time. And that's pretty much it. All I can say is if you're driving the desolate roads of Georgia at night, keep your eyes open. Because you may come across a glitch in time, and folks from a different time may be watching you. Followed by a trucker twice. From Cricket Girl 20. When I was about five years old, my mom, Mary, my brother Michael, and my sister Rosa and I, along with our dog Bandit, were coming back from Lake Thunderbird in Norman, Oklahoma. It was about nine o'clock at night on a Saturday. I remember I kept looking behind us at this semi that was only a few feet away from us, obviously riding too close. My mom asked, Taylor, are you okay? I remember replying, Mama, the semi-truck has been behind us since we left the lake. My mother, deciding to test it, pulled off the highway and the semi continued to follow. She got back on the highway immediately and kept driving until she saw a cop making a traffic stop. The semi followed the whole way. By then, my sister and I were crying while Bandit was comforting us. My mom pulled up next to the cop and the semi did as well. My mom told the cop what was happening and the semi-driver got out, apologizing. He said, Oh, I thought you were someone else. So maybe we were scared basically for nothing. Unless he was lying. I mean, who did he think we were? And what was he going to do to that other person? A few years down the road when I was 17, 
I was with my godfather, Scotty, on our way back from visiting his uncle in Ada, Oklahoma. It was 10.30 at night. Scotty had been glancing behind us for a while. Suddenly, he said, That semi back there has been behind us for about three miles. He sped up and got in front of another semi. This continued for a couple more miles. We decided to stop at a hotel to get some sleep. I made sure to call my mom, and she said, Okay, make sure you guys lock the door. After we hung up, I went to the ice machine. I saw the same semi in the parking lot. The trucker came up to me, and he began to ask me questions, which made me uncomfortable. The next thing I knew, Scotty came up behind me, wrapping his arm around me. The trucker, looking disappointed, walked away. He basically ran back to his truck and sped off down the road. After we got home the next day, I thanked Scotty so many times. We never saw that trucker again. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.